It seems pretty clear now that a settlement is in the works in the four-year-old Paula Jones lawsuit, the lawsuit that led Ken Starr to Monica Lewinsky. Aside from Ken Starr, there has probably been no bigger thorn in the president's side than John Whitehead, whose organization, the Rutherford Institute, has spent some $400,000 supporting the Paula Jones lawsuit. Is Whitehead the right-wing zealot the White House says he is, or is he, as he says, simply a product of the 60s with no particular agenda other than to do the right thing? The decision to help Paula Jones almost overnight put Whitehead in the national spotlight, a place he says he never expected to be when he founded the Rutherford Institute with his wife Carol back in 1982. The early years of the Institute, you know, we basically lived on nothing. We had a friend who made our house payment for an entire year for us because it started in the basement of our home with John as the attorney, me as the secretary, and that was it. And, uh, you know, just step by step, uh, it, it grew. It grew to an organization with 50 full-time staff members and a budget of over $5 million, most of which comes from small private donations. The Institute's regular network of 700 pro bono lawyers handles 80% of this country's cases that deal with an individual's right to freedom of religious expression. Cases like the one being discussed here, where a public school student wants to discuss his religion in the classroom. He wants to talk about Christ as his leader, and the principal is censoring anything that he mentions about Christ. And the reason is separation of church and state, so-called? Yes. Yep. Whitehead named the Institute after the 17th century Scottish philosopher Samuel Rutherford, who believed that no one, not even the king, was above the rule of law. 90% of our cases now are always against the government. Some government official who's out of control, and that government official means be brought under the rule of law. For people who are just becoming aware of, of you and of, of the Rutherford Institute, how would you define John Whitehead? Who are you? Well, uh... I'm basically a civil libertarian who believes in a wide range of free speech rights and uh, artistic endeavors. He's mellowed some over the years. Um, I was 11 and he was 14 when we first met, fell madly in love with him, and um, ended up getting married when I was 18 he was 21. So he was uh, very, what, what you would call, cocky, I guess. He, uh, <laughs> he had very strong ideas. Ideas that had their beginnings in Peoria, Illinois, where Whitehead, who now has five children of his own, grew up as the only child of working class parents who couldn't afford child care. In those days, it was safe to drop kids off at the movie theater. And sometimes in the summer, I'd watch movies all day until six or seven o'clock. So movies instead of daycare? Movies instead of daycare, and then later television instead of studying. I didn't read a book until my first year of college. But how do you get through high school if you don't read a book? I think you can get through high school without reading a book. I don't know if you can do that today, but I sure did. I did I often did my reports from classic comic books. Despite his classic comic book education, Whitehead somehow managed to get himself admitted to the University of Arkansas in 1965, where he eventually went to law school. He said he wasn't a great student. No, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't. He, in fact, he would have me go to class for him sometimes. So I took shorthand and take the notes and type them up for him, that, that type of thing. Did you have to read books at the University of Arkansas? Yeah, I read my first book there. I read uh, Goldfinger by James Bond. It's not like James Joyce or Thurber or Homer. But it was the rage then because the James Bond films were out. You know, I've seen those many times. And today I read 200, 250 books a year. 250 books a oh, year? Oh, yeah, I read a lot of books, yeah. Today, books clutter the office Whitehead keeps in the basement of his house, where he works two days a week, surrounded by an eccentric collection of, well, stuff. Stuff that literally seems to have taken over the house. The bedroom is dedicated to Whitehead's all-time favorite rock group, the Beatles. So you see yourself as a product of the 60s? I am a product of the 60s, yes. I've read that you considered yourself to be a Marxist back then. How did you come to Marxism? Well, you know, a lot of people in the 60s got radical because of all the things that were happening in the country and all the things that we saw were wrong. And you know, by um, the late 60s, I was subscribing to the Daily Worker, which is a Marxist newspaper, and was very, 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 very left spectrum thinking. And there's more. Did you inhale? Yes, I did inhale. <laughs> what? <laughs> I smoked a lot of marijuana for a while. 
Did you go beyond marijuana? Yeah, I dropped acid a number of times, and um, the last thing I actually tried was some cocaine. I'm glad I never went any further on that. I don't look back on all that as this horrible experience. I mean, I, to a certain extent, I'm glad that I experienced some of that so that I know I can speak about it. How did you get from there, the 60s, reefer, acid, cocaine, to here, the 90s, at this institute and representing Paul Jones? It was in November of 1974, the big change came in my life, so I became a Christian. It was 24 years ago that month that Whitehead, just out of law school, read the best-selling book, The Late Great Planet Earth, a book about Christianity. I thought it was a science fiction book when I bought it, and it, it uh, just seemed to say the right things. Uh, and the basic thing that struck me was it said, that, you know, Bible prophecies come true. And that appealed to me, and then a week later, I became a Christian. He called me on the phone, and he told me, and I said, are you drunk? <laughs> that, was, that was my first reaction. But that was the general reaction of just about everybody we knew. They thought he had either lost his mind or he had got, gone off on a bad acid trip or whatever. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. Did your lives change after he became a Christian? It changed dramatically because he said he, said he didn't know how he could separate um, his Christianity from his legal training. So he put them together and formed the Rutherford Institute. You've changed a lot over the years. Yes. Do you see yourself as a, as a radical or a conservative? Well, I'm a radical, yeah. I mean, everything we do here is basically radical. Do you have a, a political agenda? Does the Rutherford Institute have a political agenda? No, I'm, I'm basically apolitical. I don't make political decisions. I never have. Barry Lynn is the director of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State in Washington, D.C. He has followed the work of the Rutherford Institute for years and says Whitehead is anything but apolitical. Frankly, there is no difference between his position on issues and the positions of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and other far better known luminaries of the religious right. He is a part of the religious right. Well, he would describe himself as, 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 a, as a moderate, as someone who, I mean, after all, this is a man who in college was a Marxist. Now he sees himself hmm. somewhere in the middle. I don't think he's in the middle. I think he's uh, very close to the far end of the spectrum, close enough to be a couple of steps away from falling off the cliff. As proof of Whitehead's political agenda, Lynn points to this 1994 video narrated by John Whitehead. The video's main theme is that an oppressive government is out to brainwash America with politically correct ideology that ultimately will destroy the American family. America is in trouble. Our social fabric is disintegrating. The United States is in the midst of a series of cultural wars that threaten to undermine the basis of freedom that is part of the foundation of the country. I was particularly appalled by the scene in which uh, government agents come into a family's dining room, take off the mother's apron, replace it with a business suit, and then kind of force her out the door to work. And then the words radical feminism appear on the screen. At one point in the film you say, the radical anti-family agenda has become a reality. Divorce, the sexual revolution, the more extreme elements of the women's liberation movement certain aggressive elements of the homosexual rights movement, and the all too familiar anti-family bias of the entertainment industry have taken their toll. What about that statement is not evocative of the rhetoric of the, the conservative religious right wing? Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, if you all, I, maybe I don't understand the question. Well, you, this is a statement that you make I in there. What in that statement does not jibe with what they say. Well, it, it may jibe with what some people say on the right, and it may jibe with what some people say on the left. I don't know. But at, at that point in time, what I was seeing coming out of government, it seemed to be true to me. So do you still advocate the opinions expressed in that, in that video? Well, I think, again, some of the things I said that were harsh, probably overstated. Uh, I didn't direct the film. I had no, con I had no control over the final product. But it, you had control over what you said. Well, I sure did. It's convenient for him to distance himself from this and some of his more extreme statements, but you have to ask the question, is this distance purely 
for political purposes because it, it's an embarrassment to him, or has he sincerely changed his mind? I'd say there's no evidence of a sincere change of heart. For example, Lynn says, take Whitehead's ongoing association with Jerry Falwell. I haven't been in the same room with Jerry Falwell in 10 years. Well, you're a regular contributor to his uh, National Liberty Journal. Uh, he's prayed for your success in the Paula Jones case and his uh, Falwell facts. <laughs> he is obviously no, no friend of President Clinton's. Your daughter attends Falwell's college? Yeah, that's fine. Well, all that's true, but the point is that it's guilt by association, you know, that was uh, uh, what the McCarthy era was, the evil of the McCarthy era was blackballing people because they happened to know somebody. He says that he took the Paula Jones case because she is the underdog. He didn't take this case because he has a sudden interest in the underdog. He took the Paula Jones case because he felt that this was the one case that would help him take out President Clinton. So you don't see yourself as an anti-Clinton partisan? No. If I'm anti-anything, it's overreaching government. It's government that uh, would oppress people. Let me just read a few quotes from okay. your direct mail and some things that, that you've written. Clearly, the Clinton administration has been on the offensive against families since its inauguration. Yeah, we thought that was true at the time. Even a short inventory of Clinton's waffling gaffes and poor judgment calls raises serious questions about the President of the United States. I think in the beginning, yeah, but since the last election, since his last term, I think the, the man's changed. He is trying and, in fact, in many ways succeeding at reinventing himself. A reinvention that, Lynn says, is calculated. You know, uh, Nicole Kidman in that movie To Die For says if you're not on television, you're nobody. If he becomes a well-known national media celebrity, his organization will grow, the money will begin to flow in, and the Rutherford Institute will be in the top tier, not the second tier, of religious right advocacy groups. So who is John Whitehead? Is he a 60s idealist or a 90s opportunist? Is he helping Paula Jones because she's the underdog or because taking her case raises the profile of the Rutherford Institute and threatens the Clinton presidency? Who is John Whitehead? Maybe Whitehead, who took up painting four years ago as a means of inner expression, doesn't even know himself. This is a self-portrait. I call it self-portrait with a balloon. And it's uh, supposed to be a, a happier painting. Some of my paintings tend to be a little morose. This is happy? Supposedly happy, yes.